Like Pastor Vivian said, my name is Pastor Rick. I'm the executive pastor. I want to welcome all the new faces in the church. Can we give all the new people a big round of applause? Thank you guys for being here, for visiting us. We love you guys. We want to connect with you. There's a connect card in your seat pocket in front of you. Fill it out. Can you turn it in at the welcome desk on your way out? That would be awesome. Hey, we celebrated Veterans Day on Friday. Can we give it up for all the veterans in the house? Do we have any veterans? We love you guys. Thank you guys for your service for our country. We love and we honor the veterans around here at City Point. We just love, we love you guys. Thank you for your sacrifice and for saying yes to defending our country and our freedom. But turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, I'm reading from the ESV version today. We're going to read verses 10 through 18. My daughter just yawned. Amariah. Your, your daddy is not boring, okay? <laughs> She's like, I heard it already. I heard it. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the, uh, the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. This morning, I would highly encourage you guys to take notes today. I'm going to be doing a lot of teaching. The title of this message is Battle Ready. <laughs> Battle Ready. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you, Lord, that it's you doing this. It ain't me, God. Oh, Holy Spirit, I need you right now over these next few moments together. Would you speak through me? God, would you open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts, God? Lord, we just come against anything that may block or pen the penetration of this word, Father. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody said. Amen. Well, have you guys ever been caught off guard by something? I hate being caught off guard, man. You walk into a situation and something comes out of left field and pretty soon you're off your rocker and things don't go the way you planned it to go. Well, in military terms, it's called a surprise attack or an ambush. And it's one of the most successful strategies a military could have against another military. And on December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor was one of the most successful surprise attacks that the United States have ever encountered. And just before 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning, the Imperial Japanese Navy would descend on the naval base in Pearl Harbor as a preventative action uh, to prevent the United States uh, from interfering with its planned military action in Southeast, Southeast Asia. Check this out. The base was attacked by 353 Japanese aircraft in two separate waves. All eight U.S. battleships that were there were damaged. Four of them sank. Three cruisers sank. Three destroyers sank. A training ship, a mine layer, were all destroyed. More than 180 U U.S. aircraft were destroyed. 2,403 Americans were killed. 1,178 were wounded. And President Franklin D. Roosevelt would proclaim that day as being a date which will live in infamy. Why? Because this attack happened without a declaration of war and without explicit warning. In fact, Japan's envoys were at the, seated at the negotiating table, the peace envoys, the moment the attack was launched. You see, our country, it, defends, it depends on a strong defense, uh, on being watchful, uh, right, so that we are not surprised by a sneak attack. Uh, it depends on these things, on being powerful so that, we are not, so that we are prepared to fight when we have to. Can I just say this morning the same holds true in the spiritual realm? that you and I are in a spiritual battle, 
that we have an adversary whose name is the devil, and he would like nothing more than to catch you off guard. He would like nothing more than to take you out. He would like nothing more than to blindside you and take you out so that you cannot accomplish the plans and purposes that God has for your life. His sole purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy you. That's what he came to do. Can I just say that when you said yes to Jesus, you enlisted yourself in the military of heaven? You really did? You enlisted yourself in this battle. And so how much more so do you and I need to be battle ready so that we are not caught off guard when the enemy comes in to steal, kill, and destroy us? If you're just joining us, we're, we're in this series called Supernatural Expansion. And it's been an incredible series. And Pastor Aaron has done an amazing job uh, with this series. Uh, he declared over us last weekend that 2023 City Point Church will be a year of revival resolve. And I cannot say but how awesome, and I'm so, I'm just excited for what God has in store for this church. But I'm here to tell you today that it's not going to come without a fight. It just won't. We're not going to go into supernatural expansion without the devil being angry and without him coming against us. We're not going to go into revival resolve without a war from the devil. You see, going into those two things, it's not going to be all peachy. We're not just going to stroll right on into uh, you know, our promised land and, and kick back on a, you know, a lawn chair and drink a soda pop with a little thing out of a, a little straw, an umbrella straw, right? Some of you guys like that. I don't know. I don't drink umbrella straws. But it's not going to be peachy. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be something coming against us. You see, when Caleb and Joshua came back with the report in Numbers chapter 13, Man, they had a good report. Oh, man, this land is flowing with milk and honey. Oh, gosh, they got grapes the size of a hand. Man, we can go in and take this. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. And so they geared up in Joshua chapter 4 to cross the Jordan River. But when they went across the river, what did they see? A giant wall is what they came into. It's like, yeah, we're in a, can you imagine going around the wilderness for 40 years, being, being promised this promised land? It's going to be awesome. We cross the river. And, oh, gosh, here's the walls of Jericho. And then after that, it was the battle of Ai. And then after that, it was the uh, deception of the Gideonites. And then the five Amorite kings. And then after that, it was the battle with the Canaanites, and on and on and on and on. You see, if we're going to see revival resolve in this house, it's not going to come without opposition. It's just not. We, we're going to face off with the enemy. But we need to be equipped so that we are not caught off guard. We need to be battle ready so that when these attacks happen, we're ready to stand firm, and we're ready to stand tall, and we're ready to give it all we got. Can I just say this? If you're in the kingdom, you're in a battle. You really are. Even if you are engaging or not engaging, the battle still affects you. It really does. There's a war waging on in the heavenlies right now for your soul, for your kids' souls, for the people around you. And even if you don't engage, which is what the enemy does not want you to do or want you to do, it's still happening and it's still affecting you. And this battle can be initiated by people, by circumstances. It can attack your reputation. It can attack your family. It can attack your health. It can attack your finances and all these things. But we need to remember that these spiritual attacks, that you cannot fight them in flesh and blood. You have to fight them with spiritual weapons because they are of the spiritual realm. And maybe, just maybe, the, the lack of success you're having fighting these things is because you're fighting with the flesh and not fighting with the spirit. Because these are spiritual battles that need to be won in the spiritual realm. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not waging war, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. The weapons that we have are not of the flesh. They have divine power. Your weapons have divine power to pull down strongholds, to stop the mouth of lions, to bust down a wall named Jericho. We have divine power. And this is why the Apostle Paul says in verse 10 of our text and 11, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, he says to put on the whole armor of God. Why? He answers that question. He says that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
The word whole armor in the Greek is the Greek word panoplia, which means a complete set of defensive and offensive armor, weapons. Everything needed to wage a successful warfare. The full resources the Lord gives to the believers so that they can, can successfully wage spiritual warfare. But I want to point out something else to you. Not only do we have a complete set of weapons to engage in, in, in warfare, the Lord also gives us his Holy Spirit. We have a Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And it's this power, the same power, the dunamis power that rose Christ from the dead, dwells inside of every single one of our hearts who name the name of Christ. And it's because of that power that is on the inside of us that we are able to withstand in the evil day. So not only does God give us his armor, we have a Holy Spirit who is the power and the dunamis that makes all of this work. This is good news. I don't know if you guys realize what you have on the inside of you. His name is the Holy Spirit. It's the same Spirit that gives life. It's the same Spirit that heals sickness. It's the same Spirit that cleanses the leper. It's the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the grave. Nobody was touching hands on Jesus. Nobody was sitting there prophesying over them. Nobody was there saying, oh, Jesus, will you please just rise? No, the Holy Spirit did it of himself. That is the power that we have dwelling on the inside of us. You and I have explosive power. We have dynamite power on the inside of us to engage in this battle. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power, the word power is dunamis, His divine dynamite has given us all things, totality, all things we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory. You and I have everything we need for life and godliness. We don't have a portion of the Holy Spirit. We have it all. We don't have just a few things. We have everything. Everything we need for life and godliness is living on the inside of you. Isn't that amazing? That is good news that I can wake up every morning and face my battles no matter what comes my way. I can wake up in every morning and have confidence that the Lord has my life in the palm of his hands. Why? Because we have his spirit dwelling inside of us. So how do we do this thing? How do we stay and remain battle ready to, to stop all of these surprise attacks? The point number one is this. The first thing we need to do is realize. You need to realize. Look at verse 12. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The first thing you need to realize is your battle isn't against your spouse. It's not against your siblings. It's not against your mom. It's not against your dad. It's not against your employer. It's not against your teacher. It's not against your boyfriend or your girlfriend. It is not against the physical realm. It is against the spiritual realm. We need to realize that we are fighting a spiritual battle and it's not flesh and blood. There is something going on behind the scenes that is working these things. Now, I don't want you guys to go all demon crazy and think that a demon is hiding around every bush and it's under every table and it's over here doing this because that's not true but on the other hand we can't be ignorant of his devices we have to be able to discern the spirits the second thing we need to realize is that by stepping out in faith advancing God's kingdom outworking the giftings and callings that God has placed in your life you need to realize you're going to be attacked some of you have been getting attacked recently haven't you a lot. That's because you're stepping out in God. You're doing the things God has called you to, which is anger the devil. If you're not getting the attack, I would question if you're doing something right now. Because the attack is going to come. When we're stepping out for God, man, it drove Jesus to the cross. It drove him to the cross in three and a half years of his 33 and a half year life. When he stepped out and finally said, I'm stepping out. I'm doing this thing, man, and I don't care who cares. Guess what? That drove him to the cross. Attacks are going to come. We need to realize that when you outwork the giftings and callings of God in your life, guess what? Expect them to come. Look at 1 Peter 5, 8, 9. He says this. He says to stay alert. Be watchful. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I want to point out here that the scriptures say he is like a roaring lion. He is not a roaring lion. He is like a roaring lion. He comes disguised as an angel of light. But I want to encourage you that you have the lion of the tribe of Judah that is on the inside of you. And that lion has a roar that is way greater than the one who is like a roaring lion. Do not be afraid of him. 
It goes on to say to stand firm against him in your faith in your, and be strong in your faith. And remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of sufferings you are. We're not alone, you guys. We are in this together. The third thing we need to realize is that the attacks are working for me, not against me. God, Pastor Rick, that is crazy. Get him off the stage. What are you talking about? The attacks in your life, the troubles and tribulations in your life are working for you. They're not against you. Although they may be coming against you, it's working for you. What do you mean? Look at James chapter 1. Verse 2 says this, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, I just love James. You speak right to the heart, James. Yours. He says, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Thank you, James. That's awesome, man. I love you, bro. It's right to the heart, man. It's not what I want to hear, but it's the truth that makes me free. It's an opportunity for great joy. Why? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Why do I need endurance? Because we are in a lifelong marathon. We are not in a 50-yard sprint. We're not in a 20-yard dash. We're not in a turkey trot, a 5K run, okay? We are in a lifelong marathon, and you and I need endurance to face whatever trials and tribulations come our way. We need to be able to stand up against the schemes of the devil. We need to be able to stand up against the attacks from the enemy. You have need of endurance. And then he says this in verse 4. He says, so let it grow. <laughs> God forbid that we don't let it grow, that we go around the same mountain one more time, and then again, and then again, and then again, and then again. And finally, okay, God, finally, I'm going to let my endurance grow. God wants to grow us into mature Christians. And he often does that through trial and tribulation. He does. How awesome is it that we get to partake of Christ's sufferings? that we get to partake of, of, of the attack of the enemy, to be counted worthy enough to be in the kingdom of heaven. How awesome is it that we get to experience just a little bit of what Christ experienced? Just a little bit. And then he says, uh, fully to, let, so let it grow, for your endurance is fully developed. You will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. The fourth thing we need to realize is that we are dealing with a defeated foe who has been disarmed by Jesus himself. Okay, the devil thinks he's big and scary. Yes, he's very powerful. We all know that, but he has already been defeated. He has already been defeated. Come on, some of you need to hear that. The devil has already been defeated in your life. He really has. Look at Colossians chapter, chapter 2, verse 14. He says, he, Jesus, canceled out the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. The record of charges that were against you, Jesus himself, took it away and he nailed it to the cross. But not only that, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Jesus Christ made a public spectacle of Satan on the cross. He disarmed him. Death no longer has a grip or a hold on us anymore. We are Christians. We can put our faith and hope in Jesus and we can get into eternal life. How awesome is that? That my sins are not remembered past, present, or future. Because of the magnitude of what Jesus did on the cross, we need to realize that we are dealing with a defeated foe. That we are in a spiritual battle. And we are not to be afraid of it. Why? Because we are the line of the tribe of Judah. Judah. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. The second thing we need to do, the second point is equip. We need to equip. Look at verse 13. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore. I love that sequence of verses. Because it's telling me I need to do all to stand and then I need to stand there for. After I've done everything to stand, I need to stand again. 
after you've done everything to stand in your life, you need to get up and you need to stand again. And you need to stand there for, and you need to stand some more, and you need to stand your ground, and you need to not let the enemy take back any more territory for you and your family. I just, I just got this word right now. There's somebody in here, maybe a family, who have, you've allowed the enemy to take territory in your life. Maybe it has to do with your kids. I don't know. I'm seeing some prodigal sons and daughters. And the God is saying that you need to stand firm and you need to take back that ground and stop delaying. There's some sort of a delay. So, Father, right now we pray over that prodigal sons and daughters, God. Right now in Jesus' name, Lord, we call them home, Father. We call them home right now, Lord. And I just pray for whoever that is in here, God. I'm just seeing a couple, Lord, that you would encourage them, God, right now in Jesus' name, Father. That you would strengthen them, Lord, on the inside, Father, to stand firm and to stand tall right now in Jesus' mighty name. Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Don't all to stand, stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We need to equip. Paul says to take up the whole armor. Some translations say to put on, right? It's the sense that we need to put on this armor like a garment. We need to wear it so that we can withstand in the evil day. And it's not talking about the evil day with the Antichrist and all those things. What is the evil day? The evil day is now. And then tomorrow, that's the evil day. How many of you know that we are living in a very evil day right now in our country where young men and women are voting for abortion right now? They are voting for infanticide. They are voting for, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 you know the, the LGBTQ and all those other things, man, coming up against what this word of God says. We stand on truth in this house, you guys. How can you, how can you read this and absorb it in your heart and not allow this to just take root inside of you but go against it when you go to the voting polls? You cannot do that. It's a shame that that's happening. But you know what it tells me? We got some work to do. We got some work to do, you guys. We do. As a church, we have some work to do. And if you're caught in all those things, guess what? There is forgiveness, man. Jesus paid the ultimate price on the cross. He paid the ultimate price. There is no shame and there is no condemnation for those things in this house. There is not. But he says to take up the whole armor, right? To stand firm means to hold the line, to not retreat, to not give up an inch of God's territory. And he starts out with uh, the belt of truth. And it's important to understand that this belt was the central most important part of the armor in a Roman soldier's ar armor. It, he put it on first. Why? Because everything was attached to this armor. Right? The, 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 the chest plate was attached to the belt of truth. The sword was attached to the belt of truth. You know, his, uh, his, his shield could attach to his belt. Right? His, his undergarments attached to the belt of truth. Why is this important? In the same way, the truth needs to be the central wraparound focus in our spiritual armor. We need to have it on first. Everything needs to be connected to the truth. It holds everything together. Why? Because it keeps us stable. If we don't have the truth wrapped around our waist, we are not ready to go into the battle. Because things are going to challenge us and we have to weigh them against the truth. It holds everything together. The truth of God's word. He says the breastplate of righteousness. Soldiers would use a breastplate to cover all of, their vital, uh, all of their vital organs. Without it, you were exposed to deadly attack. And in the same way, righteousness or being in right standing with God, which is what Christ does for us, protects us from attacks uh, uh, on our heart against the areas of sin. You see, when the enemy comes in with accusations of sin in your life, right, having the attitude or the identity that I am in right standing with Jesus because of what he did on the cross, that sets me free from any accusation that you can throw at me, Satan. I am righteous in his eyes. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done. It's a breastplate of righteousness that I'm in right standing with God, and it protects my heart. Because out of the heart, right, uh, you know, protect your heart above all things. Why? Because out of it flow the issues of life. It protects our heart. The next one is the shoes of the gospel of peace. The Roman soldiers' boots or sandals would have had metal cleats on them. These cleats were called hobnails. What would they do? They would make sure the soldier had sure footing. 
that when they were advancing, when they were fighting, that their feet never slipped, that they could go places, rough terrain that other people couldn't go. And in the same way, the gospel keeps us grounded. It keeps you and I grounded. What is the gospel, Pastor Rick? The gospel is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, is there any whosoever's in here? Uh, every hand should be raised in here if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, right? That we need to bring that and put our faith and hope in him and repent in our hearts and believe that God rose him from the dead and the Bible says that you will be saved. So how much more so do we need to prepare our feet for this gospel of peace and be ready to preach the gospel and teach the gospel everywhere we go, everywhere we plant our foot. And when we go and we get attacked, we can be grounded in the gospel that it is Jesus, the good news of Jesus, that keeps me safe and keeps me secure. The readiness of the gospel of peace. Next is the shield of faith. See, the Roman soldiers would use their shields as defensive weapons to stop arrows, to stop strikes. They would also use them together with other soldiers to form a wall, to link up together. They would also wet them. So these shields had a had a leather covering on the front of them, and they would wet the leather so that way if a arrow, right, a flaming arrow would come and stick into the shield, the wetness of the leather would stop the arrow. It would quench the arrow. These shields were also very big. They were about three and a half feet wide and about three feet tall. They were giant, and the word here in the Greek talks about a wraparound faith. That when we have a shield of faith as a believer, when the enemy throws that lying dart into us, we can lift up this shield that is called faith and stop that dart. When he says you're not good enough, the shield of faith comes up and said, Christ says I am. Right? When he says you'll never be healed, that shield of faith can come up and say by his stripes I am healed. Okay? When he says that you're, you're, you're going to go to hell, say no, because of Jesus' sacrifice, I am going to heaven. Okay? That is the shield of faith, and it talks about this wraparound faith. And by believers, we can call those things that don't exist as though they do. So by faith, we call down heaven, down to earth, and we, and we say, no, this isn't the situation. You're trying to paint a picture in my mind, but by faith, this is who I am in Jesus. Right? It's a wraparound faith. And when we combine our faith with other believers, it makes our defense stronger. It really does. Why? Because if two of you agree on earth, the scriptures say that it will be done by my Father in heaven. If two of you are together, guess what? There's three there because he is in the mix in it. By the faith of a righteous person avails what? Avails much. If anybody is sick, let him call for the elders. Why? Because the prayer of faith will save the person. Faith is very huge. You have it. The next one is the helmet of salvation. You see, this helmet protected the head of the Roman soldier. They were usually very heavy with very thick metal because getting hit in the head would, would pretty much mean instantaneous death. It could leave you paralyzed, uh, right? And so the enemy attacks our mind more than anything else. Did you know that? That if he can get to your mind, he can get to your body. He can get to your heart. He can get to your soul. And so if we have a helmet that is called salvation... Now, all of a sudden, my eternal security is secure, and my mind is focused on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of my faith, and my mind is seated with him in the heavenly realm. So now I'm focusing on the hopeful things, the good things, the great things about Jesus, and not thinking about earthly things down here. When we have a helmet of salvation, we are thinking of the hope that we have in Jesus and not of the despair that we have in this world. The enemy cannot penetrate your salvation. It is secure. It is eternally secure. Next one is the sword of the spirit. And so this is the only offensive weapon that is named in this armor. You see, the soldiers could use this to strike and attack death blows uh, to the enemy, but it would work in conjunction with the shield, right? You would stop, and then you would attack. You would stop, and then you would attack. And so for the Christian, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. But it's not just the Bible, okay? In the Greek, this is called the graphe. This is the graphe. It's just, it's just, it's just a Bible. There's no power here. Like I could put this on a demon and he wouldn't flee. I can just set it on somebody and they wouldn't just diminish. Okay, there's no power, right, in the, in the, in the Bible, the graphe. The message in the graphe is the logos or the logos, right? But the word that he's talking about here is the rhema word. It's the spoken word. 
It's the right now word that you hear from the Holy Spirit about your situation, and then you speak it out with Scripture in that moment, and that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When you can grab your sword and you can turn the graphe and the logos into a rhema and begin to speak out those words, you begin to use that sword like a weapon, and no weapon formed against you will prosper. Why? Because I have the rhema Word of God not only written on my heart, but coming out of my mouth, and when it's coming out of my mouth, devil, you better watch out, because there is nothing that can stop the rhema word of God when it comes out of your mouth. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You can speak it and deal death blows to the enemy. Christ did when he was tempted by the, by the devil after coming off of 40 days of fasting. What did he say? It is written. I'm hungry, Satan. You know that. That's why you're tempting me with bread. But guess what? It is written. I'm about to take the keys of the kingdom and you're showing me the worldly kingdom. But guess what? It is written. It is written. So what does this look like? How do we arm ourselves? It starts by praying. Go out, God. Lord, this morning I put on the belt of truth, God. I wrap myself around with truth because your word is truth and everything that I do today has to hinge on your truth. Lord, I put on the breastplate of righteousness today because I am, and you declare it, I am in right standing with you, Jesus. Lord, I tie my feet with the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace because everywhere I step today, Lord, I want to be a living testimony. I want to be a gospel speaking, Lord. Everywhere I step today, I want to bring peace. Oh, God, I pick up the shield of faith because I know the enemy is coming for me, and I I'm going to quench all those fiery darts. Lord, I put the helmet that is called salvation on my head, God, because I, my eternal security is secure, and I take up my word, God, and I boldly proclaim it today that today, Lord, is, is your day, God, and not mine. And that's what it looks like. And we can pray that every single morning. You can pray it before you go into your next meeting, before you go into that hard meeting, before you go into a surgery. You can begin to equip yourselves with this spiritual armor. It's funny. Uh, most of you guys know that I've been to prison, okay? You new, new people, just hear me out, okay? I'm not, I'm not evil, okay? I, you know, I'm not going to hurt you, you know? You're not going to, you know, get stuck up in the parking lot, any of that, okay? <laughs> I'm, you know, Jesus has changed my life, okay? <laughs> I'm a living testimony of that. <laughs> but check this out. I was in a very high, secure prison in Colorado, and uh, in that prison, you were scared. You had to be scared because there were killers. There was you know, quadruple and triple homicide. I mean, these guys were killers. And um, when you went to the shower, you did not want to go shower alone. You had to have a buddy. Uh, and so your buddy would come with you, and he would be what we call suited and booted, right? He would have his full dress on, and he would have his boots on. Not his shoes, his boots. And his boots would be tied really, really tight. Why? Because in the shower, that's where all the stuff happens. That's where people get raped. That's where you get jumped. That's where you get stabbed, all those things. So he would literally watch your back while you took a shower. And then you would you know, dry off and get dressed and suited and booted and tie your boots really tight, and then you would watch his back, right? It's called, again, suited and booted. How much more so do you and I need to be suited and booted for the kingdom of God? We really do, man. We need to be watching each other's backs. We need to be watching each other's backs. We need to be uh, upholding each other, right, in Jesus' name. So we just talked about being equipped. Now we're going to talk about point number three, engage. If I can have the keys out, that would be awesome. So we need to realize that we're in a spiritual battle. We need to equip ourselves with spiritual armor. And now we need to engage. Look at verse 18. He says, praying at all times in the spirit. Let me say that again. Praying at all times in the spirit. Praying at all times in the spirit. Children of God, praying at all times in the spirit. With all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. It's not enough for you to just know about these things. It's not enough for you to just put on this armor. You need to engage in the battle. There has to be an engagement from our end because this armor does nothing. The graphic does nothing until we can engage in the battle. Well, how do I engage in the battle, Pastor Rick? I'm going to make this very simple for you. You pray. And you read, and you quote, and you pray, and you read, and you quote, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray. Prayer is the power that makes all of this work. 
Paul says to pray at all times in the Spirit. And I know what you Pentecostals in the room are thinking. You're like, man, that's the, the Holy Ghost tongues. We're going to pray all time in the Spirit. You know, that's the Spirit of the Holy Ghost Spirit. But it's not what he's talking about here. Although, warfare prayer in tongues is very powerful. It is very powerful. If you're going through it very hard, I'm telling you, man, start to war in tongues and you will break through quicker than you know. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's referring to the person of the Holy Spirit and the environment in which you pray. Check this out. The word in in this scripture is the, in the Greek word means one with, in union with, join closely to. And it's used with an impersonal dative which is, it, is of theological significance in this portion of Scripture because it denotes a supra-terrestrial locality. What the heck is that, Pastor Rick? This is awesome. Check this out. It means that something is above the earth and not belonging to the earth. So basically what he's saying is that Praying at all times is praying in unity and in union and join closely to in the Holy Spirit in an environment or a realm that is not of this world. You and I are not of this world. If you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, we are super, supra terrestrial. That we are not from here, we are from above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You and I have supernatural powers and supernatural abilities. Your prayers are so powerful, they are more powerful than you realize. Praying at all times in the Holy Ghost means to pray in an environment where it's supernatural. And when we walk into the room, we have the ability to set the atmosphere in the room. I messed it up last service, is it? We want to be thermo no. We, we want to be a thermo thermostat, not a thermometer. I'm going to get it one of these rounds here. Okay? I got one more shot. But you guys, we want to be a thermostat when we walk into the room. We want to set the temperature. We don't want to gauge the temperature. We set the atmosphere. Why? Because of who is on the inside of us. We are supra-terrestrial. Supra we are not of this world. We are from a different world. You see, I don't know if you know, but your prayers have the power to destroy the works of the devil. They have the power to destroy strongholds in your life. They have the power to abolish the plans of the enemy, to wreak havoc on the demonic realm. Your prayers, because of what's inside of you, has the power to raise people from the dead. Your prayers, because what's on the inside of you, has the power to tell that leg to grow out, and it will grow out. Your prayers, because of what's on the inside of you, has the power to set the tone in an environment where there is no Jesus, and you walk into the room and you release the fragrance of heaven all over the place. Your prayers have the power. There is no power if you don't engage. They do nothing if all we do is pray over our food and that's it. You see, warfare prayer is a different kind of prayer. It's the prayer that's on the other side of words. It's the prayer that when you have nothing left on the inside of you that I'm going to stand and I'm not just going to stand. I'm going to stand there for because I got nothing else to lose and I'm going to continue to pray until I see breakthrough. I'm going to continue to pray until I see the enemy off of me. I'm going to continue to pray until I see that wall, down, that wall fall down. Warfare prayer is on the other side of mere minced words. It's when you pray when you got nothing left inside of you. And let me just say that everyone in this room is equipped with that. Put a little hunks into it. Get on your knees. And let's see a generation changed for Jesus. Yes, we see what's going on in our society, but you and I have the power living on the inside of us to change the circumstances. His name is the Holy Ghost. And he's not a homeboy. He is the third person of the Trinity. He's got the same power that, he, that, 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 that Jesus and the Father has. We need to use him. Come on, I believe God is calling his church to activate and to begin to operate in the power of warfare 
prayer. Come on, it was a prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 that is sustaining you and I to this very day. It was a prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane that sustained Jesus on the cross. It was a prayer, if you prayed, that entered you into the kingdom of heaven. It was a prayer that your great-grandmama prayed a long time ago that sustained you through your life and is the reason you are sitting inside of this room. Prayer is so powerful, but it's not powerful if I don't engage. We need to realize that we are in a spiritual battle, in a spiritual war. We need to equip ourselves with what God has given us, with spiritual weapons, and then we need to engage in this battle and not allow the enemy to take back any more territory than he already has. You can do it. We can do it, you guys. Come on, I just sense there's somebody in here who have, you've been through the ringer and ringer and ringer and you're about to throw in the towel. But I'm here to encourage you that the Lord is at hand. He is at hand in your life like you have never seen before. And just on the other side of that is breakthrough. It may just be one more step. It may just be one more prayer. It may just be one more door that you walk in. But I, guess, I guarantee you on the other side of that, there is breakthrough. On the other side of that, God has something for you. On the other side of that, he is there. So keep on going. I don't know who that is. God, I pray over that person right now in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you would fill their heart right now with hope, God. Lord, that you would clothe them, God, with power from on high. Holy Ghost, would you just give them a fresh filling right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. You know, in warfare, there's always an objective, right? Whether it's land, money, territory, all those type of things, there's always an objective. There's a reason that we are fighting a war, that we are fighting this war. If we're going to wage war on Satan's kingdom, we have to know what, of our, what our, objecti our objective is. We just do. And our objective have never, has never changed. It was the Lord's objective, and it's our objective. It's our mission to rescue people from Satan's grip. That's our mission, and that's our objective. It's to free them from his control, just as Jesus did on the cross. You see, his whole mission was to destroy the works of the devil. That needs to be our mission too. Not afraid, not backing down, not drawing back into perdition, but to press forward to the saving of our souls, that you and I have access to the spiritual armor that we can wear, that we can wage a successful warfare too. When we engage into the battle, the enemy does not have a stronghold or a foothold on you unless you give it to him. So let's close our eyes for a moment. Lord Jesus, I feel like we need to repent from disengaging in the battle, God, from sitting on the sidelines too long, from being idle, God, from not, for not putting more emphasis and effort on this thing, for just counting it as just an ordinary thing, God, that we're just in this life and we're Christians and we're, we're doing the, the cool thing and, and, and on and on, God. We repent of those mindsets in Jesus' name. God, for not giving it the honor that it, it, it is due, Lord, that this is a real battle that we are in. But not to be afraid, not to be scared, God. But Lord, to press in with the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit as our helper. So God, right now we give you those burdens. We just release to you those things, God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, right now that you would come and empower your church. Every man, woman, and child in this room. God, that you would empower your church, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Come on, eyes looking this way. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is your time. It's his whole mission was to come to save you. His whole mission was to come to destroy the enemy's works over your life, that he took your sin, past, present, and future, and he nailed it to the cross. He really did. Why? So that I can have access to the Father once again, so that I can be grafted into the heavenly family, so that I can say no to the life that I've been living and turn towards faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the grave, you will be saved. And so on the count of three, if that's you and you say, yes, Pastor Rick, I want to I give my heart to Christ or I want to rededicate my life to Christ, whatever that is, those are online as well watching us, can you just give me a wave? Come on, one, two, three. 
Come on, all across this room as I look, from the left to the right, front to the back, anybody would say, yes, Pastor Rick, please pray with me. I want to give my heart to Christ. Awesome. Well, Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for this incredible word, God, that you spoke to us today. God, would it mess with us this week? Would you just allow it to resonate, God? We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, Pastor Aaron, come on up, brother.